those of you who know that we typically follow the lectionary in our preaching here may be aware that we are not using the lectionary today. We've jumped out for this particular Sunday as we follow along on a theme that, that goes along with our Lenten book study, thinking about Christian identity. And so today's reading is from the Gospel of Mark, the 12th chapter, rather than Matthew or John, as we would have been with in the lectionary. Jesus is here arguing with uh, some of his opponents when someone who overhears approaches him. Listen now for what the Spirit would say to us through these words. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, Jesus and his opponent. And seeing them, he answered, uh, seeing that he answered them well, he asked them, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. The word there, the Greek word, is a word that can mean your life, your being. With all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, that besides him there is no other and to love Him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that He answered wisely, He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask Him, any question? The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks God. <clears throat> Most seminaries require their students to do some sort of internship in a church congregation. And, and many of you will remember that Jennifer Eastman Hinkle and Renee Kaufman Chavez did such internships here with us. And my seminary internship, for it, I served full-time for three months in a congregation in a small eastern North Carolina town. Uh, and since it was just for the summer, Sean and our girls stayed at home in Richmond. And the congregation provided me with housing. Now how it was they originally found this place, I don't know. But I stayed in the mother-in-law suite an attached mother-in-law suite that had his own kitchen and such, at the home of Reba, a widowed Jewish grandmother. Reba's family owned a small department store in the town, and they may well have been the only Jewish family in this community. And she was most kind and welcoming, um, inviting me into her home. I had the, the run of her side of the house as well as the suite on my side. She was always thrilled when Sean and the girls would come down for a visit. And for a number of years, we, we actually exchanged Christmas cards. I know, I didn't. <laughs> so, sometimes in the evenings, we would just sit and chat. And I recall on one occasion, I, I don't know why it came up, but on one occasion, she offered that, you know, the, the differences between faith didn't much matter. All that really mattered was believing in God and trying to be good. Now, I suspect some of this was just her trying to be hospitable. It didn't mean that she necessarily saw no distinctions between Judaism and Christianity or other faiths. But then again, maybe not, because that is a, the view of many people. One popular question, answer to the question, what really matters is, well, believe in God and try to be good. Questions about what really matter are hardly new questions. The fellow in the scribe in our scripture reading this morning asked such a question to Jesus. 
Now, he's a Jew, and Jesus is the Jewish rabbi, and so he asked a very Jewish question. What of these commandments is the first of all? In other words, if I'm going to be a good Jew, what really matters? What do I have to do? What are the, the absolute necessities? And, and that book that we're studying for uh, our Lenten study asks a, a sort of similar question from a Christian perspective. What's the least I can believe and still be a Christian? Now, for much of American history, the answer to that question has been go to church and be a good citizen. And I suppose that's just a slightly more focused version of my Jewish host, believe in God and be good. Now, imagine that someone walks up to you and asks you, what does it really mean to be a Christian? What's non-negotiable? What really matters? What would your answer to them be? When Jesus is asked this question about what's non-negotiable, He quotes from the Old Testament, drawing first from a passage in Deuteronomy known as the Shema, after the first Hebrew word in it, saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And he goes on to say, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. And Jesus has only been asked for the most important commandment, the one that is first of all, but he won't stop there. He goes on, this time quoting from Leviticus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I don't know about you, but to my ear, love God with all your being and love your neighbor as yourself has a little bit of a different ring to it than believe in God and try to be good. I mean, I, I believe that the world is round, but there's no love involved, there's no relationship. I generally obey the law. I like to think of myself, at, at least in some ways, as good. But again, not necessarily does that have anything to do with love or relationships. Belief is a private thing. Something I can keep to myself. Being good is something anyone can try to do, regardless of their religion. And that means that when someone who doesn't know much about Christian faith comes into a church congregation where faith has gradually transformed into believe in God and try to be good, that they may not find much evidence there of what Jesus says truly matters. They may not find much love. Now, certainly, worship can be about love. It can be an act of love. In the same way that a lover authors a poem or sings a song or brings gifts and flowers to his beloved. The way that a child creates a work of art to give to her parent. But, worship can also become mostly about habit. A birthday card grabbed at Target on the way home to a marriage that has become mostly routine without much love. In fact, the example of marriage may be instructive for us. It's all too common for marriages over time to become lifeless. And not because either one of the spouses does something terrible or bad. It's simply that other things get in the way. Pursuing a career, raising children, keeping up with friends, doing important volunteer work, managing life's little crises and more and more things. All of these can push the relationship to the side and leave little room for love. And sometimes I think that the, the increasing disenchantment that young people have with the church parallels a kind of similar growing distrust of marriage. 
They've seen too many marriages and too much religion that appears to them to be all habit, routine, belief, and duty. It doesn't seem to be much about love, about real relationship. The time management guru was a guest speaker one day in a, a class at a prominent business college. In the middle of his presentation, he stopped and he reached and he pulled out a, a one gallon mason jar. And then he carefully took fist sized rocks and he put them in the jar, filling it all the way up. And then he asked the class, is this jar full? And the class, pretty much everybody said yes. Then he pulled out a bucket of gravel. And he poured gravel into the jar, shaking it, and the gravel went down and filled the spaces between the rocks, and he asked the question again, is the jar full? Probably not, one student offered. <laughs> then he pulled out sand, and he poured sand into the gravel and the rocks, and of course it filtered down between all the little spaces between them. And he asked yet again, is the jar full? This time the entire class, class shouted, no. no, thank you. <laughs> then he, put, he pulled out a pitcher of water. And he poured water into it, filling it up to the top. And he then asked the class if they thought they understood the point of this illustration. One, one student volunteered, no matter how full your schedule is, if you try really hard, you can always add something more. But the speaker said, no, that's not the point. The point is, if you don't get the big rocks in first, you'll never get them in at all. All too often, our lives and our faith are filled with gravel and sand and water. Rarely are these really bad things, but they, need, they leave no room for the big rocks, for what really matters. And if our lives and our faith get filled with gravel and sand and water, the only way to get the big rocks in, the only way to make room for what really matters is to dump out some of that other stuff. If we want to restore a relationship so that it is one founded on love, we'll have to make room for the other, room to spend time, space for activities together, time to just be with one another, to enjoy one another's presence time to do things together, to listen to each other, to do things that matter to the other. We'll have to be willing to set aside some of the small stuff to make room for what really matters, for the big rocks, lest that all get crowded out. And this is true for marriages and for other human relationships, and it's just as true for relationship with God. You know, congregations and denominations can often seem to be awfully focused on the small stuff, on sand and gravel and water. Christians fight over what sort of music to use in worship, what kind of liturgies to have, whether or not gays can be pastors or elders or deacons and all sorts of small stuff. I've heard over and over in my career as a pastor that the nastiest fights that ever take place in congregations are over what color the carpet should be in the sanctuary. Sand and gravel. And to outsiders, it must look even worse. But this is not the new life that Jesus offers us. 
This is not the good news that He embodies. He calls us to a new life that is about love. It is about transformed life rooted in relationships. Relationships of love with God and with neighbor. Jesus simply will not separate the two. When Jesus, Jesus had answered that question about what really mattered, the scribe who asked it was impressed and said to Jesus, You are right, teacher. To love God with, with all the heart and all the understanding and all the mind and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is truly more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And in our day, he might have added, more important than going to church and believing in God and all sorts of sand and gravel. And Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. All praise and glory to the God who comes to us in Jesus. To show us the shape of life that really matters. Thanks be to God.